sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. And once again, welcome to the back of the range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 199. Yes, I know. It's been a while since I've posted an episode here at the back of the range. I've been traveling, making some big plans for the summer. I'm slowly but surely getting back on track. Don't think for a second I forgot about my goal of 250 episodes before the end of 2021. It will happen. As many of you know, I was at the National Championship at Greyhawk in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm not sure how many of you have been out there for a golf trip or have competed in a tournament there, but this is my first time in Arizona. And being a native Floridian, I'm used to the heat, but I'm not used to the complete lack of humidity in the desert. I think I drank a dozen bottles of water a day, never seemed to sweat, and also never had to water any cactuses, if you uh, get my drift. After a couple days, you get used to it, but it was 106 on my last day in Scottsdale. I know that that is not the hottest that place gets. I'll be back next year, of course, but I think my Arizona golf trip needs to be in the fall. I really enjoyed my time at Greyhawk, especially getting to see so many players and coaches that I've covered throughout the years here at the back of the range. It was very special to see my first graduating class, so to speak, make their final appearances in college golf before moving on to the professional ranks. Players like John Pock, Davis Thompson, Garrett Reband, Kevin Yu, Austin Eckroad, all advancing through the PGA Tour U program straight to the Corn Ferry Tour. I also saw the raw motion from players like Mac Meisner that had their season and their careers end on the 18th green at Greyhawk. So many people to thank. Thanks to SMU and Oklahoma State for having me out to provide them with photos and videos throughout their national championship run. Such a pleasure and truly eye-opening to be that close to these teams as they progressed at the national championship. My summer schedule is going to take me all over the country as I attempt to cover as many amateur tournaments as possible. Remember, I'll be at the Western Amateur as a content contributor. I'm also going to be at Merido again, actually the end of this month. So end of June, Merido Amateur, I'll be back there in Dallas. Make sure you're following along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Lots of content coming your way, lots of episodes coming your way. And if you have any questions on anything, you want to get in touch with me, you want to pick up some merch, go to thebackoftherange.com. That's where you can find all of that information and listen to every single previous episode. My guest on this episode is Preston Summerhays, the 2019 U.S. Junior Amateur Champion. I've been fortunate enough to get to know him and his entire family at tournaments like the Merido Am, where he was runner-up to Luke Potter. Uh, Both of these guys are going to be playing their college golf at Arizona State. So that team is just going to get stronger and stronger. I saw him at the Jones Cup. I saw him at Terracotta. Just an incredibly impressive young talent that has maturity beyond his 18 years. We spoke about his family history in the game, dating all the way back to his great-grandfather, his personal approach to the game, the father-son relationship he shares with his father, Boyd. Now, you probably all know that Boyd Summerhays works with PGA Tour players like Taylor Gooch, and, of course, Tony Finau. So how does the coach-slash-dad-slash-caddy dynamic work? We spoke about that. We also spoke about the value of competition. And I don't just mean in these elite amateur tournaments, but also during the off days when he's home in Arizona. And I actually found out, and, and you will too, that there really are no off days for Preston. Every day is an opportunity to get better. This is another one of those episodes here at the back of the range that is rich with valuable information for juniors and parents of juniors. I can't stress this enough. Share this episode with your son or daughter or a friend that has a son or daughter that plays this great game. Preston's approach to the game, his family's approach to the game, I should say, is inspiring. And I've been around the entire Summer Hayes crew countless times. They are all about building each other up celebrating their successes. It's truly a model family on the course and off. Let's get started with this episode. Preston, you're at the back of the range. How are you? 
Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm doing great. Really happy to to be talking with you. Seem like I've seen you at just about every tournament I've covered over the last six or nine months. Um, yeah, it seems that way. I know, man. And uh, and you've been playing obviously just a ton of golf, and you're looking to obviously put your summer schedule together. We were just talking about all the tournaments that you are um, going to be playing in this summer before you head off to college, and um, <laughs> you were just talking about. Uh, I guess when you have too much time off between tournaments, you, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, you get a little antsy. So how are you managing this kind of downtime between, I guess your last tournament was the Terracotta uh, down here in Naples, Florida. How do you keep, um, I mean, I guess, how do you keep your game sharp, but then also how do you kind of level set and stay calm before heading off to your next tournament? I think one of the biggest things for me uh, in between tournaments for keeping my game sharp is to always make sure I have, I have good matches with, with great players. So lately this week, I've been playing a ton with Grace, uh, my sister. She's a great player, and we have, we have these really intense matches because we hate losing to each other. <laughs> so it makes, us re- it, yeah, it makes us really zone in, uh, and, and we have great matches. So I think uh, the more often I can play with high-level players in, uh, in good matches, uh, that's just what keeps my game sharp heading into big events. I, I have a feeling that Grace will be making an appearance on this podcast in the near future, so I think we can talk about her and then give her some ammunition that she could then use against yeah, you. Yeah, for on, sure. That she could use against you on your on a later episode. Yeah, well, it's actually really funny. So we were playing yesterday, and uh, we were playing yesterday, and I came in on the back nine, and and we're having we're having a match from there, and she she birdies like. I want to say five out of the first seven holes. I was like, geez, Grace, wow, you're going off today. And she's like, oh, I, you didn't even see what I did on the front nine. So she ends up shooting 10 under total at, at the Silver Leaf Club where we play at. And, uh, yeah, she shot 10 under. So that kind of shows uh, what level of golf I need to be playing to, to kind of beat her. And uh, I really like playing against her going into big events because it just keeps my game sharp. Hey, can you get her on the phone? I don't know why I'm even talking to you right now. I mean, seriously, what's happening? No, <laughs> I know, I know. You're talking. You're talking to the wrong person. I, I don't know what's happening right now. So now, who is obviously <laughs> yeah. that's a ridiculous score, and and um, but, yeah, uh, but I'm not surprised because I know what she's capable of. Um, who uh, who gets saltier after a loss? You or Grace? Definitely me. <laughs> Definitely me. I'm. It's it's weird. Usually, usually, uh, if it's anybody else, I'll I'll be okay. But I. I really hate losing to her. Yeah, it's just it's just something about it. I mean, it's probably just a brother sister dynamic. Sure. But yeah, I just I can't I can't stand losing to her, and w- which is great. Oh, yeah. Which is great for me to be playing against her every single day. I mean, there's not a better scenario. And then Cam somewhere watching uh, uh, YouTube, trying to figure out how he's going to dominate the world with a YouTube channel in the future. Is that pretty much accurate? <laughs> no, Cam- Cameron's always with us too. He's uh, he hangs around. He's he's getting better. Uh, and he always loves, uh, loves having matches with us. Yeah. It's always fun to, to go out and play with the family. Obviously the, the family, um, you know, typically when I start these episodes, I'll say, Hey, you know, how, how'd you get into golf? And, you know, let's go give a nice baseline so that they can under, you know, listeners can understand the, the dynamic that, that led you into the game. And for people that know even just a little bit about the summer Hayes family, I feel like this might be kind of an odd question like hey hey Preston how'd you find golf it, which seems like just the dumbest <laughs> thing ever so I was hoping you can maybe give a short maybe a short little family history about how ingrained the Summer Hayes family is in the game of golf now you are named after let's see if I have this right you're named after your great-grandfather who basically coached I think everything at the University of Utah for, for over 40 years yes yeah. So, yeah, he did. So, so there's we're we're gonna start with the great grandfather. Let's go back down to your grandfather Lynn. So I'll let you take it from there. My grandpa Lynn, uh, he's uh he's probably the most dedicated golfer I know. I think during the summer, he plays 36 holes a day. Uh, he walks. He plays really fast, and uh, he he always loved taking uh, my dad, my uncles, my aunts out to play. So that's kind of how they learned the game through him. Sure. Uh, so my grandpa is a great player. And then my grandpa's brother, Bruce, he, he played on the champions tour. He was a great player. And then 
my dad's cousin, I, I call him Uncle Joe, but he's actually playing the PGA Championship this week. Okay. Joe Summerhays. Nice. So, uh, so there's another golfer, and then my my uncle Danny, obviously played played on the tour for a long time, had a good career, and then uh, my my dad, who's uh, who played on the tour, he's now coaching coaching tour players, and that, that's kind of my family history yeah. uh, with the game. Okay, and then I'd say uh, the the way I got into the game was was through my dad. So when I was really little, my dad was playing. Uh, and he, he let me come to the course with him. And every single time I go with him, I take a loaf of bread and, and a cut down driver that he had. And I would spend all day with him at the course. Uh, I would feed the ducks with the loaf of bread and I, I hit, I hit a couple shots here and there, but that's kind of where I learned to, that's where I got into the game. That's kind of where I learned to love the game was through my dad being at the course with him. And, uh, the love of the game has only grown from there. Yeah. And you know, this, and this is obviously it's a unique story, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's over the top. I mean, obviously there are more members of your family that have reached higher levels of success than perhaps other kids that grow up as sons or daughters of a PGA teaching pro or a, or a tour player. But the one thing that I always find very interesting about you and grace and cam and just the entire family is how, I would say you're rooting so hard for each other's success, but you're also so just incredibly competitive. I mean, that story just told me about, you know, Grace going, you know, going off and and you're trying to, you know, not get beat, but you guys are just so incredibly competitive that you don't see everywhere in the ranks of junior golf. You may see kids that enjoy the game. I try my best, but if I don't win, okay. That doesn't seem to be in your, uh, that doesn't seem to be in your programming, so to speak. You just want to win at all costs. Is that fairly accurate? I mean, at, at all costs is real. As okay, that's really maybe extreme, a little. I would say extreme. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, it's right. Um, you're right. We're we're all super competitive, and I think where that competitive nature comes from is we are extremely competitive, competing with each other day in and day out. Right. It's not like we just wait till our big tournament to get competitive. We treat every single match every single day, like its own tournament. So I think that's where we kind of get that really competitive nature where we just do it day in and day out. And that kind of just becomes who we are. I've uh, spent time with other juniors where they have looked at maybe something material as a reward for playing. Well, if I play well, I win this trophy. If I play well, I'm going to get that new, shirt that new belt i'm going to be able to go out to dinner i'm going to get that new putter cover uh i'm guessing none of that even registers with you it's all about just getting a w yeah yeah that really doesn't really register with any of us right not super materialistic people so right um the competition and the feeling of winning is is uh is good enough for us okay no it's a point i wanted to bring up because yeah a lot of it's like if i do this then i get that and for you the the object is the achievement, not the reward. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. You're the youngest winner of the Utah State Amateur. Uh, so is your sister. And you've had this incredible success on, on the junior level. But um, And you are still, I guess technically, you are still the uh, United States Junior Amateur Champion that you won in 2019. And obviously 2020, there wasn't, um, you know, there wasn't that, that tournament. You're not going to be able to play in it this year. You've you've aged out. You are an old man at the age of 18 now. What are you going to miss most about junior golf? Jeez, I, I want to say the thing I'm going to miss most about junior golf is probably just the people I've met. Probably okay. all the great relationships I've had with the had with the players. Uh, they've become some of my closest friends. Uh, but then again, I'll I'll be playing against them in college. True. So, uh, I would just say, hmm. yeah, probably just the people, people I've met, sure. places I've been able to go. But then again, it's like I'll, I'll be doing the same exact thing in college against the same same people. Well, and a lot of a lot of junior tournaments, you're not just always. I'm guessing you're not always 
traveling with the family, sometimes you're on your own and you're not staying in hotels. You may be staying in, in host housing. That's another great thing about junior golf is these tournaments do anything and everything that they can to make the players feel comfortable when they're, you know, maybe away from home for maybe, you know, maybe the first time ever, but, uh, you know, probably not in your case, but a lot of these kids are traveling and they're not used to that. Um, can you think back to a junior tournament that really, not just for you, but really does an outstanding job in making the kids feel welcome to to get the most out of their game and create a memorable experience? I would say, I would say probably the U.S. Junior. The USGA does an amazing job with uh, they do an amazing job with the field. They make sure everybody uh, the field is extremely competitive. Uh, they make sure that field is extremely welcomed and then they always put us on an amazing venue so the usga hands down they do they put on amazing events that that all of the players love and and all the players love playing in now because of your u.s junior win in 19 that got you into the uh, u.s open in 2020 at wingfoot and you and i are speaking actually we're speaking during uh, during another major week, so we're speaking during the week of the PGA at uh, at Kiowa, and you know, as you said, getting into the game, you're really no stranger to being inside the ropes during a PGA Tour event. I'm sure you've been inside the ropes during majors, but this is the first one you're actually playing in. Um, what were some of the things that you noticed that were a little bit different between how some of these players acted on the range or, or during their practice sessions? at a regular tour event versus a major? I would say probably at Wingfoot. I saw I saw most of the players maybe playing the course a little bit more just because it's so tough. Right. Uh you you had to you had to learn it a little bit better. And I'd say like for for the regular tournaments that they play year year after year after year, they they get to know the course even better, but it's a US open. Uh they only play they only play Wingfoot every so many years. So I think uh, in a major championship setting, they're they're playing a lot more, trying to learn the course, uh, trying to learn the shots uh, that they need to hit out out there to to perform well, and then uh, and then they try to replicate those shots out on the range. I would say that's probably the biggest difference I see between a, uh, a major and a just a regular tour event. Okay, and and now I know that you're close with several tour players. Probably no one uh, closer than uh, than Tony Finau, and you've yeah. obviously played matches with him back home, and you've just been around him all the time. And I would hate to think that your comfort level around a PGA Tour player would prevent you from kind of fanning out and and just kind of being, oh my gosh, I'm playing in this. And look, look, there's Tiger. Look, there's. I mean. Did you at least have at least one moment where you kind of became a little bit of a fanboy, or were you all calm and collected the whole time? I mean, please tell me you were at least were a kid for a couple moments out there. Yeah, so I actually uh, first round, first round at Wingfoot, uh, I got I got to putt next to Tiger on the putting green. <laughs> and I'd say that was probably that was probably the only moment that I got that I got kind of fanboy, fanboyish. I got to putt next to Tiger and and watch him do his thing. I probably stared for a little bit too long. But, <laughs> you didn't. You didn't. Even it was. Get it to was say hi. And no, I didn't. Not 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 right. Not right before the first round. Oh, it's before he, the first was, round. Was, oh, I thought it was a practice yeah before round. the oh, first round. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, he was he was locked in. Yeah, there are there are several pictures of him, I believe, from Wingfoot that. Uh, that uh, my buddy Jeff Marsh took where he just was, uh, was laser focused. Now, do you try and achieve kind of a laser focus as well? Or are you trying to keep it light during that week? You know, you want to play well, you want to make the cut, you want to, you know, show why you're there as the, as the nation's junior champion, but you also want to keep things in perspective. You want to have fun. I mean, you're not, Yeah. I mean, I know you want to compete. I know you want to win, but I, I, you know, you're probably not saying, Hey, I'm going to win this thing. So how do you set your expectations for such an incredible opportunity, like playing in the U S open? Yeah, no, I think, uh, one of the biggest things is, is to make realistic goals before going in and not so much realistic, but makes, make goals that, uh, that kind of that are achievable. puts you in that mindset. Yeah. That are achievable and puts you in that mindset to, to keep working and to stay focused 
And one of my goals was I wanted to make the cut. And then if I made the cut, I wanted to become low amp. Uh, now that didn't happen, but, but I think it's great to have those goals. That way you always stay focused during practice and, and you always have kind of that mindset and that goal in the back of your head. So going in, I was, I was really focused and, and, and that's also the great thing about, about being intense day in and day out. I don't really need to change my mind. I'm working really hard in practice. I'm staying really intense. So that way, when I get to the U S open or I get to the big, those big stages, I don't really need to change much okay. mainly because that's what I've been doing day in and day out. So, yeah. So basically this is a great lesson for, for juniors that are listening or for parents of juniors. Um, you're, you're not trying, you're trying to set the exact same level of intensity throughout your, your season, so to speak, or throughout the year. So that when you do find yourself into uh, larger tournaments, you're not so much out of your your realm of of uh, comfort because you've been preparing for it all year. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a guy that's been on your bag just about every single tournament I've seen you at: Merido Amateur, Jones Cup, USAM. Your dad is on your bag quite often. Um, ta- and he was on your he was on the bag at the US Open. Talk to me about the advantages of having your dad on the bag. Um, how do you guys work together? I mean, he's obviously your dad. He's obviously your coach. And then Caddy, what is the dynamic? Because that's, not, again, that's something that, you know, maybe some fathers and, and mothers will caddy for their kids at tournaments, but it's a little bit of a different level when he's a, a coach for a PGA Tour players and he's a former PGA Tour player himself. Um, maybe when did he start caddying for you, not just as your father, but more so as your, your coaching caddy, if that makes sense? I actually think he's, he always coaches as a father and caddy. I don't think he always coaches as a coach. He does an amazing job at that where when we're on the range, we're practicing, he's my coach. But then when when we get all on the course, it's, it's, it's go time. We don't think about so much technique, right? Mainly just what we've been working on. We don't try to do, try to change everything. Uh, But he does an amazing job of kind of flipping that switch between, between coach and caddy and father where uh, when we get out on the course, it's go time. Uh, and, and he tries to do his best job as a caddy and as a father. Now you're, we're going to talk a little bit about where you're going to go to college in a little bit, but you know, he obviously, you know, you have his, uh, his expertise and you have him on the bag at some of these, uh, you know, invitationals and, and amateur tournaments. And, you know, it's, it's a great asset, but at, as you well know, when you, uh, enter college and you're playing in collegiate tournaments, you're going to be, uh, you know, carrying your own bag. What are some of the mental mistakes or what are some of the course management topics that he's able to help you with while he's on your bag that you're actually going to need to kind of catch yourself? You know, you're going to need to make sure these mistakes don't get made on your own without having him there. What are maybe some of the things that you find he's helping you with that you're going to need to kind of take over in those situations? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think mostly when, it, when he's caddying, I'm also, I'm also learning a lot about how to be my own caddy when he's right. not there. And, and I think the biggest thing that, that he has taught me and that I'm still trying to learn is the importance on a pre-shot and post-shot routine. So a pre-shot routine is basically you're trying to, you're trying to get all of, all of the little details into your, into your pre-shot routine. And it should be the same exact thing every time to where you almost don't even need to think about doing it. So it's like you get, you get the pin number. Uh, you look, you first always look at the lie, you get the pin number, look at the lie, see where the wind's at. Where do you want to miss it? Where can you not miss it? Uh, and then we really work on what's, what's not the pin number. What's going to be our landing number. So we always want the landing number in our head. And I think uh, the importance, the importance of a pre-shot routine is so important just because uh, that that's really where you start to, if you go through it over and over and over again, that's where you start to not miss the little details. And then uh, the post-shot routine is basically the process of diagnosing the shot or diagnosing what happened. If I hit a good shot, uh, exactly how I hit it. There's not much to really think about after, but if, if something went wrong, I need to diagnose 
whether I missed that in my pre-shot routine or if something was technical. If, if it was pre-shot routine, I, I notice it and I try to rectify it on the next shot. And same thing with technical. If I, usually I know my tendencies pretty well, so uh, it doesn't take me long to know what went wrong in my swing. I do a couple of, uh, of practice swings trying to fix it, and then I move on, go on to the next shot. So basically, pre-shot and post-shot routine is the most important thing uh, I've learned from him out on the course when he's caddying. And I think it's really important to, to not miss little mistakes and uh, kind of to get over shots, knowing what happened, what went wrong, and moving forward. Okay, so that just opened up a lot of questions that I have. That's very well said, <laughs> and I appreciate you walking me and listeners through what is actually going on when you prepare to hit a shot, then you hit the shot, and then you reflect back on the shot right there. So first question I want to ask you is, do you find that you're making more of the mistakes in your pre-shot routine, or do you find that the execution of the shot, where do you kind of find yourself questioning what happened? Is it maybe, okay, I thought that green was going to be a little bit softer and it was going to be able to, you know, hold, um, you know, you know, if the pin's 152 and I'm trying to land at 147 and I completely misjudged that and I should be landing at 140, you know, 140. Do you find it's pre-shot yeah. that you're, you're, you're looking back on or is it typically you're on point with that and you maybe just make a bad swing so usually i'll know right away whether i hit a good shot or not just because you can see where it started yeah uh and then you can see the curve and if i hit a good shot and it didn't un- end end up good then obviously i know that was a pre-shot mistake but if i if i hit a bad shot obviously i i can see that and you know i'll make I'll make some practice swings with the with correct technique, and then just move on to the next shot. But usually, it's kind of easy to see if I hit a good shot, it doesn't end up well. It was a pre-shot mistake, and then uh, if I just had a bad swing, I'll just rectify that there and just move on. Now, let's just say, just for sake of averages, that you know you're averaging seventy strokes uh, around. I mean, you're 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 breaking par, you're over par, but you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of seventy is probably fair. Um, okay. How how are you? How are you mentally kind of staying fresh after seventy shots, where it requires that much mental preparation and reflection back up, you know, back upon the shot you just hit. And then multiply that by, you know, either a 54 hole round or 54 hole tournament or 72 holes or 36 in one day. How do you take that day unplug so that you're fresh for the next day? I think, I think my personality, uh, I'm a pretty chill person. So once I'm off the course, I'm, I'm completely off the course. I, I just chillax. Uh, I do, I look at my phone. I don't really think about what went on. Okay. On the course. So when, when I'm off the course, I'm off the course and I, and I don't really focus on it. And I think that's really good just because I feel like most people can get wound up about one bad shot they hit and then they're, they're worrying about it or they're frustrated about it for the rest of the day. And that's just not good. So once I'm off the course, uh, I'm completely off. And, and I think that's more of my personality uh, that, that helps with that. So you're talking about your personality. I want to ask you a little bit about work ethic. You know, from the outsider looking in, they, uh, you know, that may not know anything about how hard it is to get to the level of success that, that you're at and that other elite amateurs are at. They may think, oh, well, you know, his, his dad's a PGA Tour coach and, you know, he's, he's hanging out with, uh, with Finau. So, of course, he's just going to show up at all these junior, junior tournaments and win. And, yeah, this is no surprise. But, you know, your dad is on tour. He's traveling a lot. He's at the PGA uh, championship at Kiowa right now. Um, you know, you're kind of left to your own devices. You have to push yourself. Um, I mean, how much, you know, what does a typical day or week look like so that you can continue to push yourself when you maybe don't have your coach around or you're not playing a match with, with grace or with, uh, you know, someone else at the club, you know, how do you set your goals that are, you know, specific to you without anyone, necessarily saying hey you know we need to go do this yeah i think that's kind of where that competitive nature comes in uh i 
I really like to feel prepared for events. So I think uh, I'll just go out to the course and practice really hard just because uh, that's what I've always been doing. Uh, that's what I've always done. Uh, ever since the age of like 14, I've been spending all day at the course working really hard. So that's nice. kind of, that's kind of just become me. So I don't really need to think about it. And I think, I think where that work ethic came from was, was my dad. When my dad first started teaching, geez, he would, he, he's a hard worker. Okay. He would work 12 hour days, day in and day out, wouldn't complain. And I think me seeing that, he kind of just set the standard. He's like, this isn't work ethic. This is, this is just what we do. This is the family this business. Is, this is how we are. Yeah. This, yeah. We just work hard. We're just going to work hard. So I think watching him do what he does and see how hard he works, he just, he set the standard and sh- showed an amazing example for me and my siblings to what, what to do day in and day out. Nice. So at this point, I'm 18 years old now. Uh, I've been doing this for years. I don't really need to think about, uh, okay, I'm going to go work really hard today. It's just what I've been doing day after day after day. Well, you, um, as you said, 18 years old, it's, uh, it's time to go to college and, you know, there for, for someone at your level, you know, actually one of the hallmarks of, of this podcast is, is sharing as much information as possible about junior golf and also how players make that, tra- make that transition to college golf you know, what are they looking for in a program? What, you know, how to navigate the whole recruiting process. Now, ultimately you decided to uh, commit and you're, you're going to be at Arizona state university. You know, the pedigrees there, the facilities are there, you know, the strength of schedule and competition, it's all there. And, you know, we're checking these boxes off, but you know, you can really find that at a lot of programs over the, you know, throughout the country, whether we're talking about Texas or Oklahoma state, Stanford and go on and on. Um, share with me a little bit about, why Arizona state ultimately became your decision of where you're going to play college golf. Yeah. So like you said, they, they have an amazing facility. Uh, I think, I think one of the big reasons I stayed in Arizona was just because I'm, I'm from here. Yeah. Uh, this is where I grew up. I, I live like 25 minutes away from campus right now. I'm just, I'm an AZ boy. Uh, I wanted to stay here. I wanted the the transition to be as smooth as possible. And then I, I really love, I really love the coaching there. Coach Thurman, coach Armin, they're amazing people. They've done great things with the program. Uh, really, really good human beings. Um, and, and they have a great team and that's kind of what I wanted to, to put myself in. I want to put myself in that situation where I'm playing with the best players day in and day out. And, and that's what ASU had for me. I, uh, I've seen a lot of different, uh, I was at SMU's tournament and, uh, I've obviously been around the country and the one place that I do need to check out is the bird, which is the practice facility. Yes, you I, do. I need to check you this do. place out because every time I see them post a damn Instagram video of them chipping and putting out there, I'm like, how do you ever leave that place? I mean, how would you ever want to, you're just going to, you might as well just have your mail sent there. Like I just knowing you, you're just going to be just an absolute range rat. If you weren't one before, it's going to be terrible. Yeah. They, yeah. They have an amazing facility, like amazing. You definitely need to go check it out. Yeah. Um, I'm sure once you saw that, well, you've seen that many times, but, but that, uh, that, that obviously didn't hurt. Um, so, so you're going to be at Arizona state and obviously you're transitioning out of junior golf, but um, a lot of interesting things have happened the last couple of weeks. Um, a couple of weeks ago, you see the Walker Cup played at Seminole. Um, the end of May is going to be the national championship. I know that, you know, actually this week is not only PGA championship, but NCAA regional. So uh, it sounds like you and I are both looking at golf stat and refreshing it quite often to see how teams are doing. Yeah, we are. Uh-huh. So um, is it starting to hit you, though, a little bit about all these things that are kind of coming your way? I mean, you're going to be on a team that's going to be competing for a national championship for for the next four years or, and, and beyond. And, and then you're also, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're probably going to be right in the mix. If everything goes your way, you're going to be right in the mix to be, uh, you know, trying to compete for a spot on that 2023 Walker cup team. That's going to be going over to St. Andrews. Uh, you have some pretty incredible things that are coming your way for the next uh, two to four years. Yeah, I do. And I'd say, uh, 
right right after I finished uh, high school a couple weeks ago, it, it like really hit me. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be going to ASU and uh-huh. ASU in August. Like this is this is amazing. Like wow, this went this went by really fast because I committed. Uh, I want to say my junior at the start of my junior year, and you know I was thinking, wow, that's so far away, and it's just going by so fast. And, and yeah, I'm just a couple of weeks ago, I just get really excited. I was like, wow, I can't believe I get to go to ASU, compete with amazing people, amazing team. Uh, I can't believe I get to do this. And I just got really excited. Well, and um, I'm sure, I'm sure you're excited about, I mean, gosh, you know, you're, you're going to be getting a bachelor's degree and probably a master's degree and a doctorate degree. And I'm just throwing this in there. Cause I know your mom's going to listen to this episode. So I just, <laughs> cause I mean, you have all this education you're going to get. I mean, look, obviously yeah. at some point you want to turn professional, but I'm, I'm guessing you're probably going to be entering this thing. Well, wait a minute. This college thing's going to be a lot of fun. I don't know how quickly I want to make that run. Cause the PGA tour is going to be there for, whenever you want to go there i mean it's it's not going anywhere yeah so before i let you go there's one thing i really wanted to hit upon which i think is you know obviously uh, you know in today's uh, society everything is on online and we have social media platforms everywhere whether it's tiktok and instagram and snapchat i mean it, it's everywhere and i want you to recognize and be impressed that i know what those things are so um, <laughs> But the thing I like is that your dad's very active on social media, on Instagram. He's always posting pictures and videos of, of your tournaments and Grace and Cam. And it's not so much of, hey, this is what my son just shot today. Here's him with a trophy. It's more of a capsule of what a very balanced and consistent family looks like when they're enjoying sports together and enjoying each other's achievements. And I guess is there some is there kind of a family creed on how you handle and navigate social media? You don't post very much, so I'm just curious. No. Like, how do you all treat it where it doesn't become bigger and you don't get it, you know, consumed by social media? How what's the, kind of like the family, um, you know, mantra, so to speak, on social media? Yeah, so so I don't post a lot just because I don't like to. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not sure why. I just don't like to post on social media, and then. Uh, my dad, he, uh, he uses social media as like a digital journal, right? Exactly. It's basically, it's basically a family journal and that's kind of what he wanted Instagram to be a journal of our family and our story and, and the things that, that we've been doing. So he, he doesn't quite use Instagram as, uh, as most people use it. He, use, he likes to use it as a journal, uh, to keep memories and uh to kind of just track our story yeah no i think that's that's well put i i like how he does it too and i, and I like where you, yeah. when you guys have like the family matches so mm-hmm. yeah and they get vicious like you said so um, yeah let's get you out of here with with a, another member uh of the family uncle uncle tony Finau. um you have had uh your your matches against him i know that there have been uh, gosh, I think there was a time when your dad did the kind of the journal, so to speak, of him uh, going for fifty nine, and uh, I'm sure now you're you're an amateur, so there's no money involved in these matches. That would nope. not, no, never, no, never, never. So tell me about your favorite uh, match against Uncle Tony Fino. Okay, so I'll tell you about the first time I ever beat him. Okay, so this was this was I want to say. Right before twenty, right before twenty twenty, and uh, geez, I've I've played with him a lot. Uh, I've played with him a lot uh, up to then, and we've had so many matches, and I've come so close every single time. It was crazy. I sometimes have a lead, and then I'd let it slip away, and I I was not able to beat him. So we're playing this match. I haven't beat him yet. And I want to say I have a three shot lead with three holes to play. And of course he goes birdie birdie and we're on the last hole. I'm one up and I have a six footer to win. And I'm not lying to you when I say this is the most nervous I have ever been on a putt, like the most nervous I've ever been on a putt. And I have this six footer to win 
and I like barely hit it and it like barely falls in the left edge. <laughs> and, and I just, I get so excited, but it's the most nervous I've been on any putt in my entire life. Uh, and that just kind of mean that just kind of shows how much, how much that means to me. Uh, cause I, I look up to him a lot. He's, he's my mentor. He's a great role model. And, uh, to finally beat him, uh, meant everything to me. Probably there's the weakest six footer you've ever made in your life. Wasn't it? Yep. Oh, for sure. One of it those was like low crawl. Barely die. Made. Yeah. Yep. Barely die in on the edge. Hey, but that counts. And I'm guessing, uh, he must've been just as happy for you as, as you were, or was he just miserable to deal with? <laughs> no, no, he was, he was pumped for me. Yeah. He was pumped. That's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. what is something, uh, now that you, we talked about that, what is something about him that maybe the average PGA tour fan just doesn't see, uh, b behind the scenes? Because look, you, you follow, you know, the golf media, you know, they're like, well, Fino, you know, he high finishes, but he hasn't won enough. And I mean, that's just what people say about Tony Fino. What is maybe something like if you could you know, grab a mic or pulse him like, you have no idea how good this guy is and you don't know how hard he works. And it's not that easy to win on the PGA tour. Yeah. I think, I think the biggest thing, uh, I think everybody knows that, that he's an amazing person. Uh, he's a great guy. He has a really upbeat attitude, but I don't think people really know how, how optimistic and how positive and, uh, that mindset that he has that he, he always thinks he's, he's going to get it. And I think that's really important for a great player. Uh, especially when you're going week in and week out with, with top finishes, he always thinks that, that he's going to win. And I think, and I think that's a great mindset that he has. He's always optimistic and he always thinks that the next one's coming. And I think, uh, not, not a ton of people see that because they, once again, they just, they just watch him on TV. Right. Uh, so I think his, his attitude towards the game, uh, is is amazing and it's something that i try i try to learn from and uh i try to take some of his, that that skill set and put that into my own game well person i'm glad we got to i'm glad we got to catch up um long overdue um i i want to get you out of here so that you can can get back out there and practice because you know you gotta not let grace you know you know, kick you around the golf course. So I don't want to take any yeah. more time. You got to get some work done, and uh, and tell and tell Gray she's uh, she she's gonna be uh, on this podcast very soon. So uh, yeah, I will do your do your thing. Enjoy your summer. I will see you at the Western. I'll see you at probably some other tournaments this summer. And uh, absolutely, I, I, pre I appreciate you stopping by the back of the range. Absolutely, thanks for having me, Ben. And there you have it. Special thanks to Preston Summerhays for joining me on this episode here at the Back of the Range. Don't forget, as always, follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All the links to this podcast can be found at thebackoftherange.com. We'll see you next time here at the Back of the Range.